Good morning, Utica. This morning, we continue our look at the practical benefits of wisdom. Uh, We have to do that because I kept waiting last week for y'all to return from your water and restroom break for the second half of the sermon. (laughs) And at about 1230, I guess uh, nobody was coming back in here. So we're going to finish it up this weekend. And I just have to say, looking up at uh, the, the, the screen this morning and looking at the backgrounds we're using for the For the visuals, some of you may have seen this on social media last week, so if you did, don't give away the answer. But as you look at that backdrop, what does it remind you of? Nobody? Does that look about right? That's pretty close, right? I figured it was a good day for us to have Krispy Kreme. We were celebrating lots, lots of stuff. Uh, unfortunately, you th- this one's empty because y'all, y'all destroyed this one uh, during Sunday school this morning. But there are a few more donuts out in the connector for you to enjoy uh, a little bit later after the service. But we got lots of great things to talk about between now and then. We got a lot better than Krispy Kreme to talk about uh, over the next few minutes. Uh, so we are, to say the least, we are at a very, very important moment in our church's history. I mean, think about it. As you can see from the worship guide today and the things that are going to be happening in just a few minutes at the conclusion of our service, today we kind of finalize the details on an addition to our church staff. Uh, We are very, very excited uh, for the prospect of Karen Bennett joining our staff and ministering to children and families. Uh, You'll hear more about that in a few minutes and have a chance to hear from Karen Uh, So we're excited about an addition to our staff, and then next Sunday, we gather in the sanctuary again, and we officially break ground on an addition to our building and to our campus. So it is an incredibly exciting and important time in the life of our church, and I would say as the pastor that it's also a point at which we need the practical benefits of wisdom, because our enemy knows that, that when we get to critical junctures in our, in our church family life together, those are opportunities to take us down the wrong road sometimes. Uh, as, as we begin to explore new things and as we take on more responsibilities, as we get to know each other, that's an opportunity that Satan might have to step in and to just sow seeds of discord among the brothers. And so I think it is a very, very timely thing for us to look back to Proverbs chapter 6 and explore these practical benefits of wisdom. So open up your Bibles, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 6. If you were here last week, we, we really got through about the first 11 verses as we looked at the fact that God's wisdom enables us to secure a strong financial base. Uh, that is going to be so critical as we enter into the next several months and, and even a, a few years of this new building project because I'm convinced that a church family is not going to be healthier financially than its individual families. If we want to be a church that honors the Lord in our financial stewardship, that begins with us honoring the Lord in our individual stewardship, the way we live our lives at home, away from this building. And so uh, God's Word has had great things to say for us, uh, say things to us as, as He was giving us wisdom for securing a strong financial base. But then we're going to look at an, another very important aspect uh, of how He enables us to walk in wisdom. So if you have your place in God's Word, we're going to be reading uh, Proverbs chapter 6. We're going to We're going to hone in on verses 12 through 19 this morning to see the practical benefits of wisdom. So if you will, stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word. You follow along in your copy as I read from mine. Uh, As usual, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. But this is what God's Word has to say to us. As we shift gears this morning, and as we look to some very positive themes that are written from a negative perspective. So let's learn from what God does not want us to be, beginning in uh, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 12. A worthless person, a wicked man, goes about with crooked speech. He winks with his eyes, signals with his feet, points with his finger. With perverted heart, 
devises evil, continually sowing discord. Therefore, calamity will come upon him suddenly, and in a moment he will be broken beyond healing. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among the brothers. I hope as I was reading that passage in God's Word that you noticed the repetition there on the one who sows discord among the brothers. God hates that. And He hates that so much that He sent Jesus to establish for us the peace that passes all understanding and brings all people together if we will trust in Him. So let's, let's trust in Him now as we turn to His Word. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the gift of your son Jesus. We're thankful that he is the one that, that breaks down the dividing wall of hostility and brings peace to those who are far off. Uh, Father, I pray that we might walk in that peace. I pray that we might be a church family that experiences that peace. And Lord, we know it only comes from you. So Father, we pray that as we look to your word this morning that you would help us to see the practical benefits of wisdom, especially as it relates to how we relate to one another. Uh, Father, we, we want to be not just individually what Phil talked about as those who have been with Jesus and, and whose presence with him is evident in their life. Father, we want the same to be true as for our church family. We want people to, to be able to come in and worship with us and, and interact with us and, and live among us and say, these people, they love each other. And we want that to be because we love you and are called to walk in, the, in a manner that is worthy, worthy of the calling which you've placed upon our life. So, Father, we pray that you would continue to show to us this morning the practical benefits of your wisdom. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can have a seat. As I said last week, we, uh, we looked at the first half of this chapter, the first 11 verses of this chapter, and we talked about the practical benefits of wisdom that enable us to build a strong financial base. We won't uh, spend much time in those verses this morning, but just to, by way of review, for those of you who may not have been here, uh, it, it talked about the fact that a foolish commitment is a trap. Uh, specifically in the text, it was talking about the, the folly of co-signing, uh, of, of making a pledge on behalf of another person, one that we have no control over ourselves. And we, we mentioned last week that, that that is an area in which we have to have great caution, that the, the overarching message of God's Word is that that kind of a foolish commitment is a trap that we can get ourselves into. We need to be very careful about that. Uh, we also saw in verses uh, 6 through 9, 10, uh, that diligent preparation is an investment. Uh, God's Word told us to look to the ant who prepares for the winter even while it is still summer. And we talked about the things that we can do financially uh, to be able to prepare for a stable future and one that honors the Lord with our finances. And then finally, looking at verses 9 through 11, we were reminded that laziness is a thief. And now we confess that all of us have a sluggard living within us. Uh, for some, it may be more evident. For others, it, it, it may be something that kind of is deep down in our hearts that is sometimes masked uh, by, a, by an overworking mentality. But there is a sluggard that lives within all of us. And so we have to be very careful to allow God's wisdom to lead us to the establishment of a strong financial base. But this morning, as I've already kind of pointed out in that repetition in verses 11 or 12 through 19, there is this repetition of the one who sows discord among the brothers. And as we get to this passage that is talking about the things that God hates, that is strong language, church. That, that is language that we don't often associate with our Heavenly Father. In fact, if we leave this church building and we ask the people living around us just to, to give us their view of God, very few of them are going to use that kind of language 
in their description of God. We don't, we don't like to think about God hating anything. We describe him as the God who is loving, and of course we know that's true, but his word here tells us there are some things that God hates. Uh, so as I've said, this is written from a negative perspective, but we're going to use it to teach us some positive truths, and we're going to see this morning that God's wisdom enables us to sustain a healthy church body. God's wisdom enables us to sustain a healthy church body. Now, I use that word sustain for a couple of reasons, and we'll, we'll talk about one of those reasons a little bit later uh, in the message. But we are blessed here at Utica. We are blessed that we do, in fact, have a healthy church body. Listen, I have been in numerous churches. I, I was trying to count up this week. I think I think I have been a member of somewhere between eight to ten churches uh, throughout my life, and I have been on staff at four different churches now. And so I think I have a fairly wide perspective of comparison. And let me just tell you what I hope you already know. Utica is unusual. I wish that was not the case. I wish that it was not unusual for a church family to be healthy relationally and financially and spiritually. I wish that wasn't an abnormality, but I'm here to tell you that in in the churches that I have been in and especially the churches that I've had opportunity to interact with, Utica is unusual. And we've had people who have seen that. We had a couple, uh, Danny and Rosemary's friends, that joined us on our trip to Israel. And just after a couple of days, they said, man, this is an unusual group because there are no problems here. There's no infighting. There's no bickering. And and they made it sound like we just did an incredible job of handpicking some people from the congregation to send on a two-week trip to, to Israel together. But I said, listen, this is the way it is. But church, let me tell you, that's unusual. And, and we need to praise God for that. Because it's, it is not the work of the staff, and it is not just the work of the church family. It is a gracious gift of the Holy Spirit. But God's Word tells us that what God has given to us, we need to work hard to maintain. And so that's why I say that God's Word enables us to sustain a healthy church body. Now, the reason I chose the word body is because, as you see here in this passage, that's what the emphasis is on. Uh, the, the, The author is painting for us this picture of an unhealthy person, an unhealthy body, using these body parts. So we're going to just zero in uh, this morning for the next few moments on verses 16 to 19. And I just want to read those verses again because they are so very important. There are six things that the Lord hates and seven that are an abomination to Him. Let's just pause there for just a moment. When we get to a verse like that, that catches our attention for a couple of reasons. I've already mentioned the fact that it uses the word hate, that God hates something. That's unusual. But then we have this numerical thing where it says there's there's six things God hates and seven that are are an abomination to him. Does that mean that number seven is an abomination but God doesn't hate them? No, that is a formula that's used in the Old Testament uh, for a couple of reasons. One is to, to, to make it easier for us to memorize this. When it says six things that he hates and seven that are an abomination to him, that's a, that's a memory device which also for us uh, should be convicting because I don't think we spend as much time as we should memorizing God's Word. But much of God's Word, especially in the Old Testament, is written in such a way that his people could memorize that. And so with the combination of the numbers and then also the, the parts of the body that are used to kind of outline this text, it is, it is a great passage for us to store away in our hearts that we might not sin against God. But the other reason that it's, that it's written that way, these numerical formulas, we, we see many times in the Old Testament where it's 3 plus 4, but now it's 6 plus 7, and the emphasis in those particular passages is on the additional item, the one that is added to the list. And we've already called attention to that. 
The seventh one in this list, as we read at the end of verse 19, is one who sows discord among the brothers. So we know the emphasis is there, but the emphasis was already there for us because that was already repeated uh, back in verse 14 with one who has a perverted heart, who is devising evil, who is continually sowing discord among the brothers. So God is getting our attention, and he's saying, these are things that I hate. So the first one is haughty eyes. Haughty eyes. Now, that's not a word we use very often. That's not a word that you hear very often. I mean, maybe if you're in Boston and you hear some construction workers talking about a good-looking woman, you might think that you're hearing that word, but that's not the word that we're talking about. We're talking about the word haughty. The description of these eyes, which demonstrate to us, some of you will figure that out in about 45 minutes. I can see the light bulbs going on now. Like, oh, I know what he was talking about. So just save those laughs for later. I'll need them probably. So now we're talking about haughty eyes, and we're talking about the, the, uh, the disposition of our life that demonstrates that we are prideful. And God hates that. For all of these, I want you to remember that we are, we are using these body parts figuratively. I, I hope that part is obvious, that the haughtiness that God hates is not limited to our eyes. This is a disposition in our life that God hates. He, look, he hates for us to live in such a way that we are looking down on other people, and we think we are more important. We think that our needs are more important. We think that everything needs to be about us. Uh, listen to these words from from Romans chapter 12, the, the, the passage I was reading during the offertory was uh, from right above this. But listen to what we read in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Now listen to this next sentence. Never be wise in your own sight. We have said many times as we've gone through this book of Proverbs that that one of our first missteps is when we stop looking to the wisdom of God's Word and we think that we've got it all figured out and we think that we are wise in our own eyes and as a result of that, we get puffed up and we have haughty eyes. Uh, So God enables us through His wisdom to sustain a healthy church body that when we are experiencing or are tempted to have haughty eyes, the The resolution to that, the solution to that problem is for us to seek humility. Remember what James says? If you're reading the book of Proverbs, you might as well go ahead and bookmark James chapter 3 and James chapter 4 because you could come back every single week. But we've we've said it before. James chapter 4 verse 6 says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Let me ask you, church, life is hard enough already, right? I mean, we go through some stuff in life that's difficult. So when you come across the difficulties of life, let me just ask you a question. Do you want to add to that difficulty by knowing that God is in opposition to you? Or do you want some help with that problem, knowing that God will give you grace? And James says, if you want his grace for the moment, then you need to be a humble person. So instead of those haughty eyes, God would encourage us to seek humility. And then there is the lying tongue. That is the second. Haughty eyes and a lying tongue. But, but church, let me just, we're not going to dwell here for very long, but let me, let me just make sure that we all know that none of us are immune to this. That we are not just talking about bold-faced lying here, which we know comes from Satan himself. God's Word tells us He is the Father of lies. So, but we may give ourselves a pass, but let me just encourage us to remember our tendencies and our temptations. Our tendency is to stretch the truth. Our tendency is to twist the truth when it's better for our circumstances. And especially our tendency is to conceal the truth when the truth does not benefit us. And I would remind all of us that every bit of that falls into the category 
of a lying tongue. And God hates it. He hates it. That's why Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. If we walk with Jesus, if we dwell with Jesus, we must be a people of the truth. I got to thinking about the armor of God, and you know, it says we have the, the belt of truth, right? Now, what did they use that belt of truth for? They used it to gird up their loins. When it was time for action, they would gird up their loins, they would take those long robes they tended to wear, and they would tuck them into their belt so they would not trip on those in action and in battle. In church, I have to tell you that life is a spiritual battle, and much of the time we are tripping over our words. We are tripping over our tongue. We need to put on the belt of truth. We need to stop having a lying tongue, and we need to speak truth. There are, there are the haughty eyes. There is the lying tongue. And then, what I'm, then there is what I'm calling harmful hands. Look at the end of verse 17. Hands that shed innocent blood. Uh, once again, we, we might have a tendency to give ourselves a pass because most of us would say, well, I, I, don't, I don't shed innocent blood. I, I, I've never done that. But remember, this is figurative here. This is talking about bringing harm to somebody who does not deserve that harm. Seeking to do evil instead of doing good. So we need to make sure that we do not have harmful hands, but instead we pursue peace. Church, this is so very important. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, one of the Beatitudes here? He said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called what? The sons of God. You want to look like your heavenly father? You want to take on the characteristics of your heavenly father, in order to do that, you have to be a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers. We are, we are inclined to err to one side or the other of that line of truth. We are inclined either to be peace breakers, to, to, be, some, to be people that uh, pursue and stir up conflict and be peace breakers, but sometimes we live on the other side of the line, and we are peace fakers. And if we are peace fakers, we are not, we are not wearing the belt of truth. We're just, we're just faking as if everything is right. But God says He wants peacemakers. He doesn't want us to have these harmful hands that shed innocent blood. He wants us to pursue peace with everything that we do. Going back to James chapter 3. Uh, look at what we read in James 3, verses 14 through 18, and you'll notice, you'll notice the, the correlation to all of these things that we're talking about this morning. Look at what he says. He says, if you have bitter jealousy, beginning in verse 14, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast, there are those haughty eyes, and be false to the truth, there's that lying tongue, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above. It is, it is earthly, it is unspiritual, it is demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure and then peaceable and then gentle and open to reason and full of mercy and good fruits and impartial and sincere. And the harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. A harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. We cannot have harmful hands. We cannot have a wicked heart, a heart that devises evil. I've been walking through the book of Esther on Wednesday nights lately, and we find in the book of Esther a gentleman, uh, he's not a gentleman, a, a bad guy named Haman. And Haman is the absolute picture of so many of the things that God hates in this passage. Haman is out to get Mordecai. Mordecai is innocent, but Haman wants him killed because Haman is prideful. And he wants Mordecai to bow down to him, and he wants to be paid homage. And he cannot stand the fact that a Jewish man in the Persian Empire would not bow down to Haman. And so he seeks not only to have Haman killed 
but to have all of Haman's people, the Jewish people, wiped out from the Persian Empire. If you don't know that story, I would encourage you to go to the book of Esther and look at this awful example of a man named Haman. But church, let me just remind you, when it says the harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace, this guy named Haman is a picture of a full-grown harvest of unrighteousness. But that harvest begins with tiny little seeds of discord. They're sowed by our hands sometimes and in our hearts. Those, those little gotcha words, those, those little jabs that we take to cut somebody else down to build ourselves up, the willingness to cut a corner in order to get ahead. God hates those things. He hates a wicked heart, and the solution to that is for us to desire righteousness, to pursue a righteous life that is only possible through His Son, Jesus. And so we are to, to, to walk away from that wicked heart and to desire righteousness. And then finally, uh, we see that God hates what I have called evil chasing feet. Uh, look back to Proverbs and, and look what he says at the end of verse 18, feet that make haste to run to evil. And I know what you're thinking. You're like, I'm in, I'm in church on a Sunday morning on Labor Day weekend. I, I could be lots of different places. My feet are not making haste to run to evil. What are you talking about, pastor? But let me remind you, tiny, tiny little seeds, tiny steps in the wrong direction. As we put all of these things together, we've, we've talked about that strong financial base. Well, making haste to run to evil would be cutting corners financially. And we've talked about the fact that laziness is a thief. Uh, one of those tiny steps heading towards evil is allowing that sluggard who is within us to take over and us not be uh, zealous in our service of the Lord, but lazy and doing nothing. He doesn't like for us to be cheaters, whether it's academically or financially or relationally. All of those things, we sometimes have feet that make haste to run to evil. What, what does that mean, church? It means that when you see an opportunity to do something that you know God would not want you to do because you can get away with it, those are feet that make haste to run to evil. Those are evil chasing feet. And the solution, the only solution, is to walk in wisdom. Is to walk in the wisdom that is available in Jesus. Uh, church, let's, let's just think about those things for just a moment. Let's think about the haughty eyes and the lying tongue and the harmful hands and the wicked heart and the evil chasing feet, and let's just be reminded that it says in verse 16 that God hates those things. They are an abomination to Him. And not only does He hate them, but He will punish those things. Listen to what it says in Romans chapter 2 and verse 8. It says, for those who are self-seeking, who do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. In church, every single one of us is guilty. There is something in every one of us that would fall into that category. And we must know that God hates those things. He is against those things. And He will bring His wrath to end those things. But praise be to God that He also sent His Son, Jesus, to cover those things. Listen to what we read in the same book of Romans, chapter 5, Verse 9, it says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. God wants to pour out his wrath on us for our unrighteousness, but he offers us the deal of the century. The Bible says that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that in him 
we might become the righteousness of God. What a great deal. Jesus hanging on the cross says, hey, church, hey, 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 world, give me all of your sin. We'll pile it all upon me, and in exchange for your trust and your surrender, I will give to you the righteousness of God. Church, we have to work hard to sustain a healthy church body. Because God loves it. He loves it enough that he sent his son Jesus to die that he might purchase a church for himself, a people for himself. And we must work hard to maintain that. Listen to Psalm 133. I love this verse. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. God loves it. And church, we're going to have opportunities over the next several weeks and next several months to either demonstrate that unity or to allow that unity to be endangered. But thanks be to God that His grace and His wisdom allows us and enables us to sustain a healthy church body. Let's work hard to maintain what He has given to us. Let's pray together.